Hey guys, my name is Victoria and I am a licensed funeral director and embalmer and we're going to be doing another reaction video today on this channel. Um, I found this video and I thought it was actually really funny sounding. It's called Funeral Home Secrets They Don't Want You to Know. So I was like, hmm, what don't they want people to know? What don't I want people to know? So, uh, we're going to take a look at this and I'm going to see if these are actually things that funeral homes don't want you to know. All right, let's take a look at this. You died. Bummer. Unfortunately, you're not quite ready to move on, so you decide to stick around for a while and keep an eye on your physical body. Little do you know, you're about to witness firsthand many of the funeral home secrets they don't want you to know. Since you're fairly young and your death was rather unexpected, you're going to need a post-mortem exam. And that's why you find yourself, or yeah. rather your body, safely stored in a freezer in the morgue in the basement of your local hospital. You so, yeah, that's actually true. Um, if someone is uh, relatively healthy and they die randomly, then yes, you would definitely need a post-mortem examination, otherwise known as an autopsy. Um, so that's perfectly normal. You watch with interest as the doctor removes your body from the freezer and prepares it for the post just a side note, it's technically not a freezer, it's just refrigeration. Um, you, you can't really freeze a body because uh, you can't get the desired results that you need. You'd have to thaw them out and it, it, it wouldn't really be conducive to any of the examination or embalming if that's what they end up doing. So. You don't really get put in a freezer. You get put in refrigeration, but it's not going. You're not going to become a popsicle. Mortem exam. They start with an external exam, looking for any obvious signs of injury or recent medical care, and taking note of any mm -hmm. defining marks like your freckles and tattoos. Your doctor dons a strange-looking face shield to start the internal exam, which seems a bit overkill to you, until he reaches for the saw. The doctor uses the saw to cut open your abdomen from your pubic bone all the way up to your sternum and to cut through your ribs to expose your chest cavity. At least they're careful yeah. not to cut too high so that your loved ones won't have to see evidence of the post-mortem exam during your funeral. You can't stop watching as the- Yeah, so, um, yeah. I can't speak to the exact tools that they use because I don't work with autopsies or as an autopsy technician, so I don't know exactly the tools that they use that would seem crazy to me too but who knows maybe they do need that because they they, they do need to get through the breastplate in order to get to uh the organs underneath it um generally speaking they make what's called a y incision so it would actually be um like this go from shoulder to shoulder down to the sternum and then down to the, the pubic bone um and that's also like to be able to cover it up with clothing, whatever the family wants to put you in if they're going to do a, a viewing or a visitation. So, uh, yes, that is that is accurate to a point. The doctor proceeds yeah. to remove your organs one by one so that he can examine each of them by turn. They work in three blocks, yeah. starting with the thoracic area. First, they remove your yeah, lungs see, and they heart. Did like a straight, sorry, they did a straight cut here, um, but it would actually be like that and then and loosen the skin up to your chin to get at your tongue and throat without leaving visible marks. Um, thanks, I guess. Next I, like how, I like how he was just like holding the lungs up in the air like, oh look, lungs! <laughs> I don't know, that was funny to me. Move your liver, pancreas, stomach, and kidneys, and they finally take out your bladder, bowels, and reproductive organs. Now that your body is an empty cavity, the doctor turns their attention to your organs and examines each of them in turn. You find it hard to pay attention to what's happening on the bench, though, when your body is just laying there, empty. The doctor doesn't find any obvious damage to any of your organs, so they take samples to send for analysis, including a toxicology screening. After the samples are prepared, the doctor carefully returns your organs to your body, roughly where they belong, then carefully sews up your incisions. You're a little bit surprised. Um, I don't know how 
they do it elsewhere, but where I work, they don't do it that way. Um, normally after an autopsy, they're not going to just throw the organs back inside of you and stitch you back up. That's not really the greatest idea. That's, that's just asking for leakage everywhere. Um, and autopsies are naturally leaky because you've just been cut open. So normally what they do is, um, when we get a body that's been autopsied anyway, uh, what I found that is done is they put everything in a red viscera bag. So everything goes into this red bag and it all gets, the bag gets put back into the cavity and uh, then the person is um, sutured up. They didn't do a cranial autopsy here, which normally they'll do that as well. So they will finish the, uh, the body cavity and before everything is stitched up, uh, while all the organs are being tested and stuff. They'll also autopsy the cranium, so they'll actually make an incision like this, and they'll peel the skin of the face, uh, the scalp and the face, forward, and they cut open the skull and remove the skull cap, and they actually take the brain out to look for any um, neurological issues, uh, aneurysm, or any kind of, you know, weird happenings, I guess. Whatever they do. Again, I'm not an autopsy tech, so I don't really know what to look for, but, you know, whatever they see that might be out of the ordinary, I guess. Uh, and the brain is actually also put into that viscera bag I mentioned. So you actually have an extra organ inside of your abdomen, uh, which is weird. So, yeah, I didn't see them do that here, um, but they probably would do that in a normal case. Surprised to see that they also clean your body to remove any evidence of the post-mortem, and they even wash your hair for you. Finally, the doctor completes their report and releases your body to the that. funeral home. Two attendants arrive to transport that. your body to the funeral home. They load up your body into a stretcher and gather up your clothes and personal belongings. You're relieved to see that your wallet makes it untouched into the bag with your possessions. But then, hey, says one of the attendants, this guy has a full Metro Pass in his pocket. That has to be worth at least 50 bucks. I'm keeping this, not like he's going to miss it. They both have a good laugh at that as they wheel your body and... Well, um... That, I would hope, never happens. That was rude of them. Um, so, when a body is removed from a hospital setting, especially after a, a, a post has been completed, um, normally with hospitals, we don't tend to send two people, at least at my firm, we don't set, tend to send two people just because... Um, hospital removals are rather easy and straightforward and usually the um the hospital staff is always willing to give you a hand if you need it so i can't speak for everywhere but in where where i am uh that would be the case they would they would give you a hand no problem um as far as stealing things from the deceased person that no no, you don't do that. You don't know. Um, also, I don't know, like, why the belongings were just loose like that. Normally, the hospital is very good about putting all the belongings in a bag, and they hand you the bag, and they say this is all of the personal effects. And then you would then, uh, you could go through it if you want to, just to make an inventory of everything. They usually give you a sheet. Uh, like a piece of paper that has all of the stuff that they found with the person listed. Um, so, you know, we would inventory with the sheet and say like, okay, this, 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 and then ask the family, would you like any of these items back? Uh, but we're not going to go through your wallet or your pockets unless asked to by the family. Like if something is missing, say, uh, don't know a cell phone is missing 
they might say like, oh, do you think you can check the pockets of the jeans they were wearing? And we can do so and see if we find it. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, I don't think the personal effects would be all loose like that. And I mean, I would really hope that whoever is doing the... Yeah, generally speaking, I don't think that we would be going through anybody's personal belongings and taking anything. At least I hope not. So, shame on these two. Shame on you. Down to the waiting hearse. After a pretty bumpy ride, you follow your body into the funeral home and into yet another freezer. Who knew death was so chilly? Well, you'd better get comfortable. This is your home until the results of the post-mortem come in. Then your death can be registered and your embalming can begin. Um, so, not exactly. Um, the only chance that we would put the body back into refrigeration and not do an embalming right away if the family has authorized us to do so is if the family is not sure what they want to do just yet. So they ask us, you know, to hold off and let them make a decision, which is fine. Uh, then we might put the person back into refrigeration depending on how much time has lapsed. Um, I know that where I live and work, there is, excuse me, a law where a body cannot be uh, out for more than 48 hours without being refrigerated, embalmed, buried, or cremated. So if more than 48 hours are going to elapse, then yes, we would have to put the person into refrigeration again until the family could come to a, a decision on what they would like to have done. Uh, and if the family has authorized the embalming, we don't have to wait for the results of the autopsy to come back for the death certificate to be filed. That could take a very long time. Depending on, you know, how quickly the samples are processed and how quickly a cause of death is determined, that could take months. And you definitely don't want um, a person to be, you know, hanging around for months like that. So we don't have to do that. Um, what they'll do is while, while they're waiting for the results of all of the testing, toxicology, all of the things that they're doing with these samples to come back, uh, the medical examiner will usually put the cause of death as pending. So that just means that uh, they're waiting for other results to come back in order to determine what the exact cause of death was. So. Uh, yeah, we don't have to wait for that to happen in order to proceed with the embalming. As long as we have authorization from the family and they say, you know, we want to have this done, we want to do these kinds of services, uh, we're giving you permission to embalm, then we could just go ahead and, and do that. So, yeah, not exactly. I don't know where, um, where the people that created this video are located so I don't know where exactly they're getting the information from it could be that they're located in a different area and maybe the laws are a bit different but as far as I know you it's pretty consistent so yeah, no, you don't you don't have to wait for for all that to be done before you proceed with embalming. As long as you have permission. Don't embalm without permission. If if they don't give you permission, then obviously we're we're not going to do it. So a little while later, you're not sure if it's hours or days. Time is pretty weird when you're dead. Your body is once again pulled from the freezer and placed on a table in the funeral home's dedicated embalming room. The funeral director comes in with the embalmer chatting about the arrangements for your funeral. The public viewing is in two days, so we need the embalming done in time for the private family viewing tomorrow night, says the funeral director. No problem, says the embalmer. Did you tell them that embalming wasn't actually necessary, especially I could keep him on ice until the viewing and put a plastic suit under his clothes to manage seepage? It's cheaper, especially if they're just going to cremate him. Of course not, said the funeral director. Can't have that getting out. That would ruin us. They both have a good laugh while you look on fuming, since they're Wow, okay, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, so it looks like the funeral director in this situation has is 
hiring an outside embalmer, possibly a trade embalmer to do the, the prep for them, which is very common. A lot of funeral directors um, that I know don't embalm at their firms. They choose to just be directors and just make arrangements and deal with the families. And they have a trade embalmer or a person that works just for the firm, whatever it is, that does all the embalming and the behind the scenes work for them. So that is common. Um, I am licensed as funeral director and embalmer, so I, and I have a dual license, so I do all of that myself. Um, and what the embalmer is saying in this case is, from what I'm gathering, they're not having a public visitation. They're just doing a private ID and then having him cremated. Um, and in that case, yes, the embalmer is correct. You can keep the person in refrigeration until the family comes in to do the private visitation or ID. And the plastic suit that he's talking about is um, when we have people when we have people um, that are either embalmed or unembalmed, um, in order to protect against any form of leakage, which you know it can happen, um, more so. Actually, I shouldn't even say more so. It's probably equal from either a, an embalmed body or an unembalmed body, there is always a chance of leakage um, from anywhere, really. So what we have is uh, plastic undergarments. So we have, um, we have some that have feet. So it's like a pair of pants with feet on the bottom, like footy pajamas, but not pajamas, just plastic. Um, then there's ones that we have without feet so it's like a like a, a long short with like an elastic band that um, grips around the uh, like right above the knee kind of and they they actually go like all the way up they they'll you, you pull them all the way up they sit to about here so everything is covered there's also other things like um, there are stockings, plastic stockings so if you put them in coveralls and you see you know maybe there's a little puncture, on the leg from something that they had in the hospital or whatever. Um, you can put a stocking on the leg. Uh, we have sleeves. So if there's any type of like pinholes or things happening on the arm that you're worried about with leakage, you can put a sleeve on, uh, on the arm or arms. Um, and there's also something called uh, a union all which is kind of like a big plastic jumpsuit. So you put it on and just zip it up and it covers everything. So it has like the feet and all, all up to here. It has the sleeves and just zip it up. It has a little tie you tie in the back. And um, that's, that's really for like extreme situations. Uh, we don't normally use a union all unless we absolutely have to. Um, so normally, you know, we tend to put plastics on everyone because there's always that, like, you know, it's just as a precaution, like a just-in-case type of thing. Um, so what this embalmer is saying is he can just put the person in plastics and keep them refrigerated until the vis the private visitation that the family is going to have. And he's saying, you know, did you tell them that embalming is not required? So he's right. Embalming is not required by law. Embalming is suggested for a public visitation. And it's also suggested if the person is going to be with us for uh, an expanse of time before the visitation happens. So if a person is going to be staying with us for a week, even with refrigeration, there's still going to be decomposition happening. And embalming would be the best way to slow the, um, the decomposition down 
refrigeration can only do so much and yes uh, refrigeration will also slow down decomposition somewhat but even with refrigeration you're still going to have things happening things are going to be breaking down the body is going to go through its natural phases of putrefaction so embalming is really the best way to preserve the body until that visitation can occur. So that's why we suggest it for public visitations, especially. Um, but yes, so he's right to a point. Um, it, it just would depend on how quickly this, this private ID is going to happen, I guess. But usually for a private ID, um, and then a cremation, we'll just suggest that it would happen the day after we get the person into our care. We'll have the, the family come in for arrangements and then if, offer them the opportunity, like, would you like to see your loved one before the cremation? And if they say yes, then we'll clean them up, set their features, clean them. Um, it's called sanitary care, so it's just all of that without the chemical part, the embalming part. Uh, and then they're free to come in and spend some time with their loved one, and then the cremation will happen a day later, probably. Um, but then in this situation, the embalmer is offering that option, and the funeral director is saying, oh no, we can never tell them that, that'll ruin us. Um, yeah, not so much. We do that quite often, uh, especially for a cremation that's not going to have any public services. It doesn't really make sense to have all of the hoopla going on and have the embalming done unless there's, you know, other types of circumstances. But, um, yeah, that's not a very good funeral director if he's saying that, so... There's not much you can do about it. You are a ghost after all. You settle in to watch the embalming process. Besides, you didn't like the sounds of uh, seepage. First, the embalmer unwraps your body, then cleans it thoroughly with a disinfectant spray. Rigor mortis is set in, making all your limbs stiff and hard to work with, so they spend some time massaging your limbs to work it out. Then they make a small incision in your groin and fill your body with formaldehyde. As you watch the formaldehyde flow through your body, you're shocked to see your body begin to Okay, wait a second. I thought he was autopsied. Wasn't he autopsied? Didn't they... They, they did an autopsy. Why are we making a, an incision in the groin? He's... He's autopsied. You, you don't... You don't need to do that. <laughs> um... Yeah, that's... That's not right at all. Uh... <laughs> that's actually kind of funny. Um... So... Before, in, in the beginning of the video, they said that he, this, this person was autopsied. So you don't have to make any extra incisions in a, on a person to embalm them if they're autopsied. Uh, what you'd end up doing is um, you would undo that suture that they made. Um, op you'd open everything up, um, remove the breastplate that they cut, remove that viscera bag that I talked about with all the organs in it, the viscera bag would go into uh, another bag inside of a bucket. And what we'll do is instead of treating the cavity with the trocar, since everything is open and we don't need to do that, um, we would just take a couple bottles of the cavity fluid that we would have used and pour it into the, into the bags that are inside of this bucket and kind of let them marinate a little bit. Uh, kind of sounds weird to talk about marinating organs, but yeah, that's kind of what they do. They sit there in the cavity fluid. They're marinating, okay? Um, so, while after that's done, everything is already is exposed. You have an empty body cavity. So, all you would have to do is locate the stumps of the arteries in all of the locations that you're going to need to inject. So the head and face, the arms, and the legs. So you can see them, you know? Like arteries are kind of like squishy macaroni noodles <laughs> or like 
thick rubber bands, they, they kind of feel like this, except they're thicker. Uh, but yeah, they feel like that. And they're hollow. But um, yeah, so you would just locate those and inject one area at a time. So you would inject down an arm, you would find the, you'd find the, uh, the axillary um, over here and you would inject down the arm, you can do the same on this side, you would see the two carotid stumps on either side of the head, and you would have to inject up in there. Um, you'd also have to like undo the head incision and take the, sil the skull cap off so that you can embalm that area. And there's, um, there's actually a little circle of arteries um, at the base of the brain called the Circle of Willis. So you actually have to go in there with some hemostats and like clamp those off so that you don't lose all the fluid and then it circulates throughout everything. Uh, but that's d d lots of detail. Um, but yeah, you'd go up here, up here, make the face all nice, and then you would locate the, um, the iliac arteries at this point. Like you'd find the iliac stumps, the iliac flows into the femorals. So you would find the iliac artery and inject down each of those and um you don't need to make extra incisions because everything is exposed for you you yeah but um regardless of that so even if he if he wasn't autopsied i still don't know why that's a very archaic way of embalming. I know that a lot of like very old school embalmers would they like to use the femoral arteries because they like to keep this area free of incisions. That's not usually the way that we do it nowadays. Um, I would think that they would want to make the incision where the right common carotid artery is. So right here, um, and if they needed to, if he wasn't getting good distribution down to his legs, then you can raise a femoral artery and inject down the leg. But yeah, I don't know why he's starting with the femoral artery. That's, I haven't seen that. Um, I've actually, I've only had to embalm one body that way, but that was because the man actually had a, a congenital, um, anomaly in his arteries that prevented us from using his carotid artery. It was very strange. It was almost like a, I forget the name of it. There was a name for that condition, but I completely forgot. Um, but it was like, almost like a nest of arteries going in all sorts of different directions right here. And I was like, am I going crazy? Like there's the artery, I see it, but there's like another little offshoot coming off this way and that way and why? And then my, my boss came in and said, oh yeah, that's, that's an anomaly. Like you, you'll have to go through a different site. Let's use the femoral. Like, oh, okay. So that was strange. Um, but yeah, that was the only time I ever embalmed an entire body with the femoral artery, but I would never use the femoral artery as my first point of injection. So, yeah, yeah, I, I don't know why they, they would do that. Interesting, okay, let's keep going. Plump up and get more color. You're actually starting to look more yeah. lifelike, creepy. Next, the embalmer makes another incision, this time under your rib cage, and inserts a metal suction tool called a trocar attached to a pump system in your chest cavity. You watch with horror as they use the trocar to puncture each of your organs and drain them of fluid, including your bladder and bowels. Yuck. Thankfully- That's all true. But my question is, what are all of these? What are those? <laughs> what are those? I, I can't tell what those even are. If those are supposed to be trocars, that is not a very good illustration or animation of a trocar. They look just like big push pins. And why are there three of them? <laughs> I'm confused. You only need one. <laughs> you just need the one and attach the hose to it. Actually, what's funny is that looks like the handle of a trocar right there, sitting in um, some antiseptic. 
they they make um cabinets like that where the embalming machine goes and they have like these little uh reservoirs where you put like an antiseptic solution um down there and then you can stick the trocar in there to disinfect it at the end of your embalming of course so that actually is what that looks like right here so what are these why are they sticking giant push pins in him i mean minus the fact that they don't even need to be doing that because the poor guy was already autopsied and the viscera bucket this is very interesting. Oh boy. Wow. See this, like, uh, this is kind of like why I like making videos um, about funeral service and what goes on in, in our field because this was obviously made by someone who didn't know what goes into embalming a body or anything like that. So the fact that they're showing it this way means that this is what they think happens. So that's not good. That's not good at all, that that's what they think happens. That's not what happens, I promise. We don't stick these giant push pins into your belly. I promise it's not what happens. Okay, let's keep going. The embalmer is wearing gloves and a mask, and the suction system is airtight, so none of the fluid comes in contact with the embalmer. Once your body is completely drained, the embalmer refills it with a liter of fluid, which saturates your organs and mitigates any nasty smells. Now that the embalming is complete, a liter of fluid. I don't know how much it actually is. We put two bottles in, one up, one down, and each bottle is 16 ounces. So that's 32 ounces. I'm really bad at this, but um, how many ounces in a liter? Okay, so almost. Thir one liter is 33.814 US fluid ounces. So. We put two 16 ounce bottles in, that's 32 ounces, so I, uh, a little under a liter, I guess, yeah. Uh, but we put a bottle up, a bottle down, and yeah, that's it. I was just wondering, I was like, a liter? That seems excessive, but I guess not, because the liter would just be those two bottles, or a little over two bottles. But why does that seem so much bigger than what it actually is? I guess because I'm thinking of a so of like a bottle of soda, but that's two liters, right? Like a bottle, a big bottle of soda is two liters, right? Uh, for some reason, I was thinking that was a liter. No, that's two liters. Okay, so half of a soda bottle. That seems a little more. Uh, that that seems a little more accurate. Okay, all right, all right, all right. I get it. It's time to prepare your body for your viewing. You find it hard to watch the embalmer stuff your nose and throat with cotton to prevent any smells or fluids from leaking out, but even worse is watching them dry out your eyeballs. This is an important step though, and if it's skipped, it can lead to liquid seeping from your eyes, which might look like tears to your horrified family. After drying them, plastic half-moon caps are placed under your eyelids to keep them from collapsing into your skull. The final indignity though comes when they get- All right. So first of all, the setting of the features, what they're doing right now, should have been done before the embalming. So that's actually the first step. We would set the features first and then do the embalming. Because the thing is that once a body is embalmed, everything firms up. So getting the face to go into the expression that you want it to be after an embalming is very hard to do. Because the if the mouth was open, let's say, and so the, so the person comes in like this. After the embalming, it's going to be very, very hard, if not impossible, to shut that mouth again. Maybe not impossible, but it's going to be very difficult. Um, so we do all that first, and that way, when the body is embalmed, everything is firmed up and you have the nice expression, like, permanently. I, I can't think of any other word besides that, but permanently on the face. Um, the whole thing about stuffing your nose and throat with cotton. 
No, uh, generally speaking, no, we don't do that. We don't, we don't stuff the nose and the throat with cotton. We clean it. Um, we use cotton to, you know, swab out the nose, swab out the mouth, make sure everything is clean in that area. Um, but we're not going to stuff you full of cotton like that. No. Uh, the, what we would use cotton for is if you needed it, um, usually this is only for like older people that are a little bit emaciated. Um, we will use cotton to kind of put into the mouth, like around the lip area, lip and cheek area to fill it out a little bit and make it look less sunken or emaciated. But that's really all we would use the cotton for. We're not gonna stuff it down your throat. That's kind of weird. Uh, the other thing about drying out your eyeballs <laughs> to prevent eyeball leakage. No, no, that doesn't happen. That, that's not, that doesn't happen. Um, we do use eye caps, but the eye cap just goes over your natural eye. We don't dry out your eyeballs. We clean your eyes. Like um, we'll use a, like a bleach mixture to clean your eyes and your nose and your mouth all the orifices of the face but we're not gonna dry out your eyeballs or so or whatever they're thinking that we're gonna do and then i heard a mention of glue no don't use glue please don't use glue i i never glue anything i'm not gonna glue your mouth or your eyes shut i promise glue um there is a mortuary super glue and I, we don't use that for gluing your mouth or your eyes. You really don't need to do that. It leaves a, like a crusty residue behind. And that's really inconvenient. It's, first of all, it looks bad. Like it looks ugly. So then you have to like pick it off and it's, it's, it's just a pain in the butt. But then also when you're applying cosmetics to the face, that crustiness is going to really hinder your ability to make that mouth look nice. So don't, just don't do that. That's just unnecessary. And for the eyes too, don't do that because then you get like eye crusties and it looks very bad. Um, what I do personally is I just take a little bit of Vaseline and I run some Vaseline over the lip and close the lips and that kind of keeps them together without, um, causing any type of residue and it also is like a moisturizer as well uh to prevent anything from drying out so um that's what i personally do and i also put a little bit on the eye cap to kind of keep the eyes uh shut nicely so yeah don't please don't glue anything <laughs> it's just you're just making more work for yourself if you're gonna do that so don't do that get ready to dress your body after a thorough cleaning, to your dismay, the first item they put on you is an adult diaper. This is meant to protect the coffin and your clothes, not to mention your loved ones from any leakage, but that doesn't make it any easier to watch. <laughs> pampers! <laughs> They're gonna put pampers on this poor dude! Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. We don't put diapers on you. <laughs> no. Um... The plastic garments, the plastic undergarments I mentioned earlier, those, I guess, are the diaper, if you want to call it that, to prevent leakage from getting into the casket and on your clothes. So, yeah, we put something on you, but we're not putting a diaper on you. We're not going to put you in pampers or depends or anything like that. So, not, not to, that'll be a no from me on the diaper. <laughs> Last but not least, your hair is styled, your nose and yeah. ear hair is trimmed, and some light yeah. makeup is applied. Your body is even treated to a last manicure. Mm -hmm. Finally, you're dressed in your best suit, and you have to admit you look pretty darn good for a dead guy. After the embalmer leaves, two attendants enter the room wheeling a coffin on a stand. That's not a coffin, Recognize that's a casket! That's a casket! I can see it, it's rectangular. That is a casket. I have a video explaining the differences between coffins and caskets because they're two different things, completely different things. Uh, this is rectangular from what I see. It looks exactly like what we have in our showroom at my, at my job. So that is a casket. That is not a coffin. You're, this is not something for Dracula. So that's a casket. Um, just wanted to put that out there.
recognize one of the attendants from the hospital. He's the sneaky Ooh, bus pass thief. Bus pass you thief. don't recognize the other one. He vaguely looks uneasy about being so close to your body, so you conclude that he must be new. Your suspicions are confirmed a few minutes later when the bus pass thief nods toward the coffin and says, OK, newbie, go open the lid so we can get this body loaded. The newbie edges closer to your casket, keeping one eye on your body the whole time, as if he half expects you to sit up at any minute. As he reaches out a hand to open the casket, the lid flies open and a body sits up and reaches for him. He runs from the room screaming bloody murder, and you have a feeling he won't be back. Did you see him run? What a scaredy cat, says the man sitting in the coffin, joke. who you now recognize as the other attendant from the hospital. I knew he wasn't cut out for this job. Good riddance, says the other. Okay, get out and help me with it. Finally, they carefully like place that. you into your coffin Cascade. and wheel you out into the visitation space. You have a lovely service full of family and friends, and you're happy to see that it seems to bring some closure. But you're not quite ready to move on. You've heard terrible rumors about what happens in crematoriums, so you're going to stick with your body for a little while longer and see for yourself. After another bumpy hearse ride, your casket arrives at the crematorium. The crematory operator takes a numbered card from your coffin and places it on a board next to what looks like a large furnace. You realize that this is how they make sure that they know whose remains come out the other end. The operator opens the coffin and checks your body. You see him notice your watch, and then watch in horror as he leans in and removes it from your body. How many times do I have to tell those dummies at the funeral home to remove the watches before they drop them off? Don't they know that watch batteries can explode in the cremator? You feel a bit better, but still resolve to keep an eye on your watch from now on. Not. Okay. Um, first of all, it's not called a cremator. It's called a retort. That is the chamber where the cremation occurs. It's called a retort. So that's one thing. Second thing, um... I don't know anything about watch batteries exploding. They might, but watch batteries are so tiny that even if they did, that it would just go poof and it wouldn't really cause an issue. Um, not that I would want to cremate a body with a watch on because that would just be um, a, a, a cry and shame. I, I would hate to do that to somebody. We always ask, you know, would you like the, the, the belongings back? and we'll give the jewelry and everything back to the family. Um, but yeah, a watch I would definitely recommend that the family take because you really don't want to burn those things up. That That's just a shame. But um, if they did want us to keep it on the person, then obviously we would. Um, the only things that we take out of a person because they're not good to put through a cremation process, they're not good to further retort, is a pacemaker. So pacemakers contain mercury, and mercury can actually explode in the in the retort. So we have to remove those. And of course, we'll tell the family, you know, we, we did notice that the person had a pacemaker. We do have to remove that before the cremation takes place. Would you authorize us to do that? And they'll say yes. They sign something to say that we're allowed to do it. And so we will then remove the pacemaker. It's very minimally invasive, it's just we make a little incision, pop it up, and cut the wires, and that's it. Um, but yeah, there's not much that can't go through the cremation process. If the person has like metal implants or something like that, that's perfectly fine. Normally, um, you know, they'll go through, and after the cremation is over, the people in the crematory will take all the remains out of the retort, and they'll take out any of the metal um, implants or things uh, and discard those and um, process the remains. So That you can do much about it. The operator starts the cremator by turning on the gas and heating the chamber to a scorching 750 degrees Celsius. All the while, they're monitoring the systems by the computer. You see a screen full of readings for temperature, emissions, and oxygen levels, but it means nothing to you. You realize that this must be a much more complex process than you thought. Before you know it, the cremator is ready. This is the part you were worried about. You've heard stories of funeral homes stealing coffins and reselling them, but your fears are soon calmed when you overhear the operator talking to his assistant as they load your body, casket and all, into the furnace. I have had um, people ask me that question, like, oh, well, if the person is cremated, don't you just take the casket back and resell it? No. That casket stays with the person, and everything gets cremated. 
obviously, you know, for this purpose, you can't do a metal casket because that's not going to burn very easily. It would have to be a wooden or a cloth covered casket. But um, yeah, we don't take the casket back and try to resell it when somebody's cremated. That's just wrong on so many levels. I'm glad this guy's family didn't cheap out on the coffin and go for one of those cardboard boxes, they say. Those things are so inefficient. The wood from a coffin burns first, which helps create the perfect heat and burning environment for an efficient and even cremation. There, so the wooden this... boxes that they're, the cardboard boxes rather, that they're talking about, that would be for if a person is not going to have any type of services before the cremation. Um, so it's just going to be direct cremation, nothing else besides that. We don't have to put the person in a casket. We'll just put them in something that's called an alternative container. So that would be a plywood base with a cardboard top because the crematory requires the person to be in something in order for the cremation to happen. It doesn't have to be a casket, but it does have to be something. So for those types of situations where the person didn't have any services prior, so they don't have a casket, the alternative container or the cardboard box, as these people said, it's not really a cardboard box. It's like partially cardboard. It's like half cardboard. The top part is cardboard. The bottom is wood. You get what I mean. Um, but yeah, they're not exactly inefficient. So I don't know where they got that from, but yeah. They say as they shut the door to the cremator, that was a pretty small one. Let's give it an hour or so. After an hour has passed, the operator returns to check on the progress. They peek through a window hours. in the side of the no, chamber and announce that the cremation process is done. You can't resist sneaking a peek yourself, but all that you can see is a glowing pile of ashes. The operator shuts down the machine and leaves the assistant with the unenviable task of raking out the remains. Once the machine is cooled down, the assistant uses a 15 foot long steel rake to push the remains through an opening in the bottom of the cremator and into a bin to cool. Finally, the assistant picks through the bin of the cooled remains, taking out any metal hardware left over from the coffin. When he's done, you notice there are still some large chunks in the mixture, and you worry that he missed some hinges or screws. The operator sets you straight when they return to inspect the remains. Good job, I think you got everything. Looks like we have some bone fragments, maybe a piece of a hip or a shin bone. That's to be expected, the bigger bones don't always break right down. And those young bones are stronger yes, after all. Don't worry, the cremulator will take care of them. You barely have time to register this bit of gruesome news before the assistant whisks the bin of your remains over to the cremulator. A cremulator, as it turns out, is a machine that uses steel balls to grind the remains into a fine, mm -hmm. uniform ash and filters out any unsightly bigger pieces. Once the cremulator has done its job, your remains are transferred to the beautiful decorative urn that your relatives have selected and placed in a storage room to await pickup. You're relieved to see that your watch is placed alongside your urn and at least it didn't go missing. Satisfied that your body has been properly and respectfully dealt with, you finally decide that it's- I just that noticed it's... The, the, the creepy, like, the creepy horror movie music that's been playing in the background. I resemble that remark. Time to leave and go explore the rest of what the other side has to offer. Your soul is at peace now that you've learned the funeral home secrets they don't want you to- Okay, so, um, they did get a lot of stuff right. Uh, yeah, they got a lot of stuff right, but there were a few big things that I saw that weren't exactly accurate. So, um, it was actually, this is actually a funny video. This is actually very funny. So, um, I think that a lot of people think that this is actually what happens um, behind the scenes with funeral homes. And, um, yeah, I mean, I went over everything that I saw that wasn't exactly true, that wasn't what we would do. So you kind of get an idea of what exactly happens. Um, but yeah, I just thought it would be kind of funny to react to something like this where it's, you know, people that aren't in the funeral industry saying like, oh, this is stuff that funeral homes, they're secrets that they don't want you to know. I mean, I don't think anything is really secret. Um, generally speaking, a lot of funeral homes or funeral directors won't talk about a lot of the stuff that happens behind the scenes because um, it can get 
graphic for some people and they don't want to know, you know, what happens during embalming, what happens to my body after it's taken out of the hospital or the home or the nursing home facility or what have you. Um, a lot of people just don't want to know. So we'll tell the people that want to know and we don't say anything to the people that don't want to know. So that's, that's all I really can say about every, about all of that. So anyway, um, I hope that that was useful information that you, uh, enjoyed that, um, cute little video. So, uh, let me know if you have any suggestions for other stuff that you want me to look at and maybe tell you if it's true or not or whatever. But yeah, that's all the facts I have for you today, guys. Be safe out there. Um, make good choices. Uh, follow me on my social medias if you haven't done so already. I will see you in my next video. Bye!